you know, Pamela uh, depends on all of you, and it depends on uh, the on the the host committee. And without people like Dean Powers and Maria Bullion Fernandez, and um, the the students and the faculty and the staff of Seattle University, this would not be possible. It's it's it looks like it's easy to put on a conference, but I think uh, it's not <laughs> easy to put on a conference <laughs> as anybody who's tried to do it. And I think this I don't know if this is our largest conference in a long time uh, because you know things have their ebb and, ebbs and flows. But I think we're at about 700 people approximately at the conference and um, 177 sessions approximately. Um, so you can imagine the amount of work just the, trying to make name tags is and trying to get, trying to get me to give them, <laughs> the host committee, you know, the information so they can print things on time. And so th it's been really wonderful working with the host committee. I wanted to thank them specifically. Uh, just right now so I don't forget. So the Seattle University Host Committee is Maria Bullion Fernandez Chair, Sonia Barrios Tinoco, who made sure the registration, Sonia, you should sort of wait, and Maria, you should wait. Uh, they, uh, Sonia was in charge of the books, she was in charge of the red, a lot of the registration and uh, a lot of other elements. Uh, Gabriela Guterres Muse, um, who's here, where's Gabriela? So thank you, Gabrielle. Gabrielle is the one who enabled us to get the band for tonight, and we're so excited about that. Um, uh, your husband, right? It's your husband's band. <laughs> it's wonderful. And, and Kate uh, Copeland, Father David Lee, uh, Charles Tong, and the host committee, just without them, we couldn't have done this. So I just want to make sure I said that before I forget. In addition, we, um, we also want to make, I want to make, uh, uh, take a moment to thank uh, some people who made donations this year. That everybody who donated the scholarship fund, thank you. Five dollars is really valuable. And I got a, 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 just a, we gave out, I think, 53 scholarships to help graduate students come. And something like $3,700 in total uh, awards to graduate students this year, which is uh, up every year, especially now with the economy being so bad. And so when you make a donation to the scholarship fund, you really are helping grad students to get here. And in particular, I'd like to thank uh, John and Christine Smith, who are, who are here. Thank you so much, John and Christine, who donated $700 this year to the scholarship fund. And uh, it's just a, lo just a lovely donation. And I'm really uh, doubly touched because uh, Christine is an alumni of, of the school I teach at, Metropolitan State University of Denver. And uh, I think, was, was, were you a student of Linda's back then today? And Linda Lake Peralta is here, a colleague of mine, and I think Linda, thank you too for, for coming. If you wouldn't come, then John and Christine wouldn't come as well. So thank you so much. Also, I don't think, believe he's here, but Larry Peer, who's a longtime Pamela member, donated oh, well over $2,000 to Pamela this year. So I just did want to make, men, mention that, you know, for those of you who are longtime Pamela members, if we're trying to think about endowments, we're trying to think about ways to really have an endowed scholarship or endowed awards, which other regions do. And we could do it, you know, we could name it after some beloved person. So it's hard to talk about, you know, asking for money, but without the money, we can't do the, we couldn't have had Sandra Cisneros, we couldn't do all the exciting things we do. We couldn't have uh, Jose da David Salivar, who's gonna be our speaker, our plenary speaker. Thank you, Jose, for coming. Uh, on tomorrow, you're all welcome to come tomorrow. We'll have chairs in the back if you're not joining us for lunch. So anyway, thank you all so much for being here. And uh, to move us along, I'd like to introduce last year's uh, Pamela uh, president, who was wonderful, wonderful to work with, uh, Sab uh, Sabina Welke. And she's gonna do the introductions from now on. Thank you so much, Sabina. As immediate past president of PAMLA, I'm very, very honored to be able to introduce this year's president of PAMLA, Ana Maria Rodriguez Vivaldi. Ana Maria uh, grew up in Puerto Rico, where she attended the university, University of Puerto Rico, Mayag West. Uh, she then relocated to the States for her graduate work, uh, where she attended the University of Massachusetts Amherst where she holds an MA and a PhD in Spanish literature. 
Her main areas of research are 20th century and contemporary Latin American uh, literature and culture, but she also works on colonial aspects of Latin American literature and culture and 20th century peninsula, so a very, very broad scholar. Uh, she is an associate professor of Spanish in the Department of Foreign Languages and Culture at Washington State University, where she also serves as associate dean for student affairs, which she likes to call the good affairs. So as associate dean for student for the good student affairs and global education in the newly uh, configured College of Arts and Sciences. We're not here to celebrate her administrative um, uh, role, even though it did show uh, her leadership skills uh, showed greatly during her involvement as second, uh, second vice president, first vice president, now president of PAMLA in uh, helping us all to articulate advocacy stands. And her, also her leadership um, introduced new um, issues in the program, such as the Creative Artist Spotlight that we all um, were very, very honored to uh, experience last night. So that's all, thank you to Ana Maria. As a scholar, she has written and lectured on Puerto Rican culture, uh, theater, and turn of the century dramaturgy. I was very, very excited to uh, see that she has published in our own journal, Pacific Coast Philology, our editors are right here, of two essays, one on film collaborations across the seas and another essay on Laura Esquivel and the multimedia novel. Uh, she is also active in the Rocky Mountain uh, MLA, and she has served as the editor of that journal, uh, the Rocky, Ro uh, Rocky Mountain Review, for three years. And I was also very, very excited to see that there is a special issue of Pacific Coast Philology in the works that Ana Maria is editing on hybrid journals. If you've been to last year's conference and this year's conference, there's a series of linked panels on hybrid genres. That's also uh, thanks to the leadership of Ana Maria. Uh, and so we can look forward next year, hopefully, uh, to uh, receive another special issue on on uh, hybrid genres. Her lecture today is in that vein, in that spirit of hybrids and other fusions. Please join me in welcoming Ana Maria Rodriguez Vivaldi to the podium. First of all, thank you, Sabine. You present a very nice <clears throat> view of really what is really a very time-consuming job <laughs> that doesn't allow me a lot of free time. But um, I have to admit that I do enjoy all I do, and I most of all enjoy coming to PAMLA every single year and seeing so many wonderful faces over and over again, truly friends. And I do thank all of you for being here today, and um, I hope you enjoy uh, this brief presentation. So. Hybrids and other fusions, really a cultural voyage. That's really what I want to sort of take us on. And to start then, let me show you an image. <laughs> Contrary to expectations, this is not a talk about cars or about food. Though I recognize that the words hybrid and fusion may have brought these topics to your mind. So, though recognizing the beauty, at least in my husband's opinion, uh, and creativity behind these products, the kind of fusion I'll be addressing is that referring to the synthesis or connection of two or more distinct things that, when applied to the ongoing blending of cultures that has taken place over the centuries, and to current student, uh, studies on transnational movements, migration, and globalization, eventually leads to a discussion of hybrids. If we consider that what we call Latin America is a unifier for something that is in reality uh, quite homogeneous and heterogeneous, 
We're talking then of Latin America as a hybrid. Today, in our cultural studies, we recognize that notions of diversity and plurality are intrinsically linked to the development of any complex social and political organization, as well as to material scientific and artistic, artistic progress. But the colonial agenda that was put into place at the end of the 15th century by Spain had a static notion of society defined by a cultural homogeneity. The colonizers' whole purpose was to maintain the colonies, and the best way to control them, they believed, was to pacify the people by promoting and imposing their language, religion, culture, and institutions. All social levels were expected to behave in a similar way, with similar moral values and sexual behavior, supporting the same concepts about religion, authority, and hierarchy, and learning and using the same language conveniently supported by the 1492 publication of the first grammar eh, of a Romance language by Antonio de Nebrija, followed in 1567 by his Reglas de Ortografía Española that stated the rules and conventions for writing. So despite cultural variations, remarkably so similar social structures will develop throughout the region as an extension of a medieval feudal order. A tiny corps of royal officials supported by the military government the co uh, will govern the colonies in collaboration with the clergy and a slightly larger class of landholders and merchants eventually. Of these European, peninsular, and American-born Creoles, uh, families and bureaucrats will dominate the Native Americans, blacks, and people of mixed race who form the majority of the population. So there is, in a sense, a reason to group together all these nations, particularly the Spanish-speaking ones. That said, in the development of Latin America as a society, or even as what could be construed to be a civilization, many elements will come into play directly or through the sieve of the diverse cultural groups as they encounter each other, negotiate the terms of their interactions, and work towards a fusion or integration variously identified over time through terms such as mestizaje, creolization, or syncretism. Today, I would like us to join together in a brief voyage to explore some of the products that have resulted from these interactions and to assess where we stand today in this journey towards self-definition. Perhaps the first evidence of an early negotiation between the Spanish newcomers and native communities is embodied by the individuals that resulted from their unions, that is, of mestizos such as author Garcilaso de la Vega, El Inca. He was born in Peru, which is today in, in, in well, Cusco in Peru, in 1539, and his father was a very prominent uh, conquistador or captain, Sebastián Garcilaso de la Vega y Vargas, and his mother was Isabel Suárez Chimpu Oclo, niece of the Inca or king, Huayna Capac, and concubine, never married, to the Spanish captain. So their son was really one of the first Peruvian mestizos, and both sides of the family took great care to ensure that he was exposed to the traditions of the respective cultures. He learned first Quechua and then Spanish before embarking on an elementary study of Latin in Cusco. Garcilaso's writings provide eloquent testimony to the emotional and intellectual struggles faced by the, this un, unique hybrid of the old and new worlds, and his attempts to find a place in the new society. In his books, in his book, Comentarios Reales de los Incas, or True Commentaries of the, About the Incas, that came out in 1609, he asserts his right to express a real truth, because his mixed background had allowed him access to both sides of the cultural divide, thus proposing the superiority of the hybrid over that of one of the original components, as both would lack the deep knowledge of the other that he possessed. By depicting an orderly Inca regime in contrast to the chaos that ensued from the Spanish takeover, Garcilaso seems to suggest that the main problems were based on a series of cultural misunderstandings that the Spaniards were gallant warriors indeed, and pious Christians, but their failure to learn Quechua and their undervaluation of, their co of Inca culture had tragic consequences. Sounds familiar to foreign languages departments, by the way. 
Darcy Lazo will argue, and bravely so in an age of inquisition, forbidden books and racial intolerance, that the Spanish colonies needed a new regime led by those who understood the traditions and above all, the languages of both Inca and Spaniard. Unfortunately, this enlightening, albeit self-interest program was ignored and all known copies of the Inca's history uh, and commentarios in Peru were quietly seized by royal officials in the wake of the 1781 uh, Tupac Amaru uh, rebellion. Other social negotiations and fusions in the 15 and 1600s will bring the systematic acculturation of the natives in spatial terms through an eclectic assortment of architectural styles made even more complex since at the time, the Spaniards were experimenting with a mix of elements ranging from the neo mudejar Isabelin Plateresque, Gothic, Italian Renaissance, and Mannerism. These complexities in form and meaning can be explored through the Royal Tower built in 1559 in Tepeaca, Mexico. It was built to serve as a picota, where Polish punishment was carried out. In its style, it reveals the uh, cultural complexity of early colonial architectural design by showcasing elements from the Spanish Islamic amalgam known as Mudejar with indigenous and Spanish ideas on the use of stone and mortar. Reminiscent uh, of the Golden Tower in Seville, I'm sure some of you will recognize it, it serves as a reminder that Spaniards themselves came from a culturally mixed world, but were mixing as well with a new one. In addition, it must be pointed out that the long-standing social patterns in Tepeaca, such as communal cooperation, were an essential feature of an ambitious architectural project like this one, but that, at the same time, that social quality was being used to inflict a Spanish model of political order, that is, the permanent presence of Spanish justice represented by a picota. Thus, the rollo is both a visual metaphor for mestizaje in its use of Nahua construction techniques in the Mudeja style, as well as an active agent in the creation of a mestizo society. Ongoing cultural interactions and the use of native and slave labor in the construction and decoration of religious and civil buildings will lead to a syncretism of indigenous and also African motifs with Christian uh, symbols, a style identified as tetiki in Mexico. These special symbols gave uh, the natives something they could relate to, to you know, something to understand and accept. This is an example some, from Santa Maria Tonantzintla Church in Cholula uh, from the 1730s, and it mixes, you know, these native motifs with the churriguere style that came uh, from from Spain. So you have the the Caribs really having these brawny faces and Indian features. And there's a lot of symbols that refer to the cult of Cotonantzin, who was one of the deities in their own culture. And there's another example, this, which I think very, is very cute, uh, of the little face there. It's a, it's a, a flat-nosed Indian carob on the east doorway in the San Miguel Allende Church in Mexico, which was actually built by mulatto. So one of them, you know, they carved this particular uh, carob to look like him. A similar process of negotiation of cultural and racial interactions will take place in art. For instance, the traditional native art form known as plumeria or feather mosaics was adapted for the depiction of Christian subjects such as the Pantocrator, a feather mosaic from Tepoztlan. In its creation, its native artists initiated the process of recasting indigenous beliefs and practices into new parameters established by the colonial church and state by using these feathers. And feathers were a material highly valued in, in the Indian um, culture, uh, above that of precious metals, for example. At the same time, this production exposed how the Spanish missionaries were expanding their own notions of beauty and how religious ideas could be expressed. Thus, by finding a common ground, the high value of feathers and the high value of the Christ motifs, this particular hybrid product succeeded in fusing the two value systems. By the 1600s and early 1700s, both in Mexico and in South America, large-scale paintings for public buildings will go beyond religious themes and begin to depict contemporary and local events. 
An example is a procession of Corpus Christi, 1680, by an unidentified painter, which records a religious procession and combines a very naive, kind of dreamlike quality with a luxurious sense of detail, which was inspired by the European Baroque. Little by little, we'll find that the conqueror is looking to instill its presence in the format brought over by the conqueror, with the end result of a product that not only showcases the acquisition and mastering of different artistic skills, but the ability to use them for social commentary beyond its intended decorative use. Another example is this Biombo, bien, uh, portraying a view of the Palace of the Viceroy in Mexico City. And it offers a panorama of Mexico City's center and visually echoes the political order of the colony with the viceregal uh, palace dominating this, the scene. It's a very seemingly casual vignette of daily life, but it can also be read as a prescription of social roles. The viceroy coach, drawn by the elegant um, black horses, rolls past the palace and the upper class residents stroll leisurely along the tree line paths of the Alameda at left, while the lower castes, the indigenous, the African, the mestizo, and the mulatto people work the market stalls at bottom right. Thus, the hybrid established in his understanding of his own position in the society where it exists, and is allowing the viewer to derive his own interpretation about the situation. Latin American economy will boom in the 18th century and new population centers will develop, especially in mining areas. As criollos begin to take pride in both their ethnic heritage and the culture of their homelands, they will seek paintings that reflect this appreciation with some interesting results. One example <clears throat> is the Virgin of the Mountain of Potosí, 1720, from La Paz, Bolivia, where the body of Virgin Mary merge, merges with the great silver producing mountain of Potosí in Bolivia. This appeal to viewers in Potosí by showing the otherworldly manifest in the familiar landscape, the mountain that dominates the town. The painting's patrons were pictured at the bottom. And these elites may have been giving thanks for the riches they accrued from the mines, but it was widely believed by Spaniards and Creoles that the mineral wealth God had bestowed on the New World was a sign of his support for their colony. On the other hand, the painting exposes a non-traditional religious view of the Virgin, more in tune with a pantheistic belief similar to religious practices prevalent among Andean cultures. Another example of Criollo pride in Andean culture is a portrait of Don Marcos Chicoatopa, <laughs> a powerful Andean. He appears elegantly and richly dressed in a black cloth outfit adorned with gold chains and embroidered lace. Across his forehead hangs the mascaipaicha that, before the conquest, was the exclusive signifier of the Zapa Inca. Here, it is used to connect him to the former Inca rulers and symbolically secure his ties to that history. His pose, though, along with the painted setting, is drawn from European portrait conventions. Though, he is providing a bridge among two traditions, a symbol of how they have come together in a visual image, of clear arrogance indeed, if not challenge to the European viewer. Eventually, political and social discourse ongoing in European colonial empires towards the end of the 18th century, as well as in the colonies themselves, will have serious implications in the appreciation or not of what this process of fusion or integration is bringing forward. As Robert Young suggests in his 1995 study on colonial desire, the notion of the hybrid will evolve from a simple description of a product to become a discursive tool used to promote a feeling of fear, specifically directed to the notion of racial mixing. Some of the scientific models of anatomy and craniometry will evolve and be used to argue that Africans, Asians, Native Americans, and Pacific Islanders are racially inferior to Europeans. The fear of miscegenation that follows directly responds to the concern that the offspring of racial interbreeding will result in the dilution of the European race. In Latin America, this social stratification as it relates to race and the growing need to quantify it will give way to the production of casta paintings, a popular genre in the 18th century. These paintings were made in both New Spain and Peru primarily for patrons of the upper classes, 
often Spaniards who have been in the colonies or have strong curiosity about the Americas. Casta paintings portray the complex process of mestizaje or race mixing among the three major groups that inhabited the colonies, Indians, Spanish, and Black, along with typical costumes, textiles, and agricultural products. Though in reality, if we are to be sincere, by this time, the ethnic situation had grown so complex and it was so difficult in practice to tell by appearance what an individual's parentage was that only a few basic terms for castas were actually used in practice. Most of these paintings are comprised of 16 scenes that link purity of blood to status. The Spaniards would have the highest social standing and they would usually appear on the first panel uh, and then across successive scenes the purse will become darker and increasingly poor. And then those in the lowest rungs would be those of mixed blood or those so barbaric and or uncivilized as to be beyond the realm of mixing. More importantly, perhaps, these works reinscribe two colonial presumptions, that such intercultural or interracial mixing would manifest itself visually and socially, and that such a process demanded commentary. By this time, it is clear that hybrids are seen as an anomaly, a weak and diseased mutation. So despite the backdrop of the humanitarian age of enlightenment, the concern for racial purity responds clearly to a need to protect the social hierarchy and the position of Europeans at its summit. This will be the backdrop for the social transformation that followed the ending of the Spanish colonial mandate in most of the Americas during the, 19, the early 19th century, accompanied by the eventual economic liberalization, a rising internal movement towards urban centers, and rising waves of immigration taking place over the century. All these Ill elements will eventually alter the use, understanding, and appreciation of those hybrids. A key author leading the discussion and establishing certain parameters will be Argentine writer and statesman Domingo Faustino Sarmiento, who established education systems in Chile and Argentina before becoming president of Argentina in 1968. His pamphlet criticizing Argentina's dictator, Facundo, Civilización y Barbarie, established the opposition between barbarism, barbarie, and civilization as a recurrent motif in Latin American uh, literature. Sarmiento contrasts the barbarism of the Hispanic, rural, uneducated culture with a European tradition that is urban, intellectual, and sophisticated. While this opposition does not sustain close scrutiny, really, it established a powerful model for the subsequent analysis of Argentine culture and with some revision, Latin American culture as well. One result was the ongoing dichotomy between a literature viewed as authentic and nationalist pitted against a literature that is more inter internationalist and thus modern. While it is true that Latin American literature will begin to take on distinct national characteristics, there are still attempts to preserve some sort of continental unity, such as the first Spanish grammar designed specifically for Latin Americans, the Gramática de la Lengua Castellana destinada al uso de los Americanos, written by Andrés Bello in 1847. Just as Antonio de Nebrija did at the dawn of the Spanish Empire, Bello attempts to sort out the competing regional language differences and proposes a single educated linguistic standard for the entire continent from an American, not Peninsular Spanish, perspective. So, while recognizing on one hand the reality as well as unique expressions of our Spanish language use in the Americas, Bello remains tied to the static colonial desire for that cultural homogeneity. Indeed, it can be stated that at least outwardly, many authors in the 19th century are still Eurocentric in their view of what constitutes literature, and though many will attempt to give European literary trends a unique and uniquely Latin American flavor by using elements taken from local geography or the ethnic composition of the population, most still inscribe themselves in that European-derived literary model. This will not be a negative development, after all, as Romanticism will dominate the first half of the century. Given that, as a movement, it did emphasize individual experience, the expression of emotion, and the role of the imagination and creativity, all elements that will support the creation of hybrid expressions, Romanticism in Latin America will lead to fervent nationalism 
an emphasis on native themes, and an exposition of differing political visions that will support the growth of a sense of identity. Some writers that respond to the challenge, uh, posited by the unique realities of their national context, uh, will be, for example, Clorinda Mato de Turner from Peru, who spoke Quechua and Spanish, and was familiar with the indigenous Peruvian culture. Her most significant contribution, Indianist novel uh, Aves y Nido, is remarkable for its sincere and nor cartoony, cartoonish portrayal of indigenous culture in its and its layered depiction of Peruvian women. As Naomi Lindstrom has stated in the novel, and I quote, language and culture of Andean Indians are represented, represented with a thoroughness truly unusual for its time. And Mato's concept of companionship, marriage, her advocacy of women's education, and her beliefs about women's distinctive character reveal to today's readers the outlook of a 19th century Spanish-American feminist and progressive." End quote. A distinctive Argentine culture also emerges from the reading of the 19th century epic uh, poem, El Gaucho Martín Fierro, and its sequel, La Vuelta de Martín Fierro. The central character of these epics represents the common people who are victims of 19th century migrant movements and other elements of modernization, such as the fencing of the Pampas, or plains in Argentina. In particular, the first poem concentrates on the noble resistance to modernization by the nomadic gaucho, or cowboy, Martin Fierro, while the second poem showcases ongoing changes in Argentine society by proclaiming the gaucho, who by then has become a, a salaried cow, a cowhand, can be a partner in helping convert the pampas into a source of wealth from cattle production. Hernandez's portrait of the freewheeling gaucho reduced to a hired hand is, is a little bit disturbing. Yet Fierro's rustic uh, wisdom and countryfied sayings also serve as a means for extolling both the people and the land of Latin America's uh, rural past. <clears throat> a third example that fully embodies the notion of the hybrid, not in himself, but in his literary production, is Ricardo Palma, a Peruvian scholar and author. His enduring fame and a unique place in Spanish-American letters comes from the creation of a new genre, the tradición or historical anecdote. Part fiction and humorous fiction, and part historical reconstruction, and delving on common linguistic uses and colloquialisms, these sketches and stories about colonial Peru are permeated by wit, love of the past, and an all-encompassing imagination. And they were published in a long series of volumes called Traiciones Peruanas, which is there. By the last quarter of the 19th century, the literary movement uh, known as Modernismo in Spanish-American uh, literature uh, will provide further evidence that Latin American countries are developing unique literary characteristics of their own as a result of interesting fusions. Nicaragua's uh, Ruben Darío officially inaugurated Modernismo in Latin America in 1888 with his uh, book Azul, which is a collection of poetry and short stories. And what Darío does in his book, sorry, <laughs> Uh, it successfully blend several literary trends in vogue at the time, such as Parnassianism and symbolism, uh, which were European, but he brings them on to the Americas and combines them, and at the same time communicates conflicts that they engender, particularly in the uh, limitations of form, the pretensions of culture, and the nostalgia for an uncomplicated pre-modern culture. By incorporating new poetic forms and revising modes of expression, especially through the luscious, lushness and musicality of language, Darío will revolu revolutionize the literary language of Latin America, and that sets the stage for the 20th century. In art, the post-independence national period will bring social changes with long-term consequences for its practitioners. Sources of patronage change. The middle class, military, and government administrators emerge as important pa patrons, rather, leaving behind the aristocracy and the church. These new patrons will look for art that reflects local life. In addition, the dialogue between official art forms and folk art is reopened. Scenes of everyday life, landscapes, still lives, move from the margins of artistic production to the center. Thus, the iconography of empire will slowly be replaced with an alternative visual imagination specific to national self-determination. This is an example, Francisco Lasso, uh, from Peru and his paintings of Peruvian uh, natives engaged in everyday activities 
combined academic genre and naturalistic interests. And he will be the one setting the tone for indigenism, which is a movement that will ser seek to recover native culture and portray native themes from a more realistic perspective. And I do want to call your attention to the three races or equality before the law, because that's really a very evident, you know, uh, study of what's going on still then, verdad, in terms of racial relationships. Mexicans, Jose Maria Obregón and Félix Parra will paint indigenous figures as well and take themes from Mexico's ancient past eh, in a neoclassical style, it's true, but they do reflect the development of a sense of national consciousness, even if in conformity with classic cis conceptions of beauty. And this is Jose Maria Obregón's The Discovery of Pulque. Eh? And, um, what he does is to contest the static representation of the indigenous that prevail in the casta paintings, for example, by removing them from the present and placing them in an originating and allegorical time, uh, which is a little bit ironic, of course, because uh, by being restored to history uh, by this mestizo state of Peru, the Indians are still marginalized and rendered invisible in the present. But it is what it is. And the next one is Feliz Parra, eh, Friar Bartolomé de las Casas, and Masa Ma Massacre at Cholula eh, from episodes of, the con episodes of the Conquest, where the artist emphasizes the cruelty of the conquest to justify the need for independence from that colonial past. Thus, the paintings become historical revisions with a political agenda, as well as works of art. With the beginning of the 20th century, the rhetoric of hybridity in Latin America will become fundamentally associated with the reemergence of a Pan-American discourse and the need to define who we are and where we are going, as Europe seems to stand on the brink of destruction, besieged by the chaos of world war and revolutions, as well as the rise of communism. And the United States en engages in an empire-building behavior after the 1898 war in its interaction with several central in South America and Caribbean nations, including taking over uh, Puerto Rico as a territory as a result of the war. A critique of cultural imperialism will be evidenced in the voices of many authors in different ways, from Rodos, uh, Uruguay's Rodos denunciation of North American utilitarianism to Maria Degui's proposal for a socialist revolution that should evolve organically in Latin America on the basis of local conditions and practices, not as a result of mechanically applying a European formula, though he self-identified with communism. This stage in the history of Latin American hybridity is characterized by literature and theory that will focus on the uh, effects of mixture of an identity and culture. Two key styles will emerge eventually. That of marvelous reality, a translation of Cuban novelist Alejo Carpentier's phrase, Lo Real, Maravilloso, who used the term in the prologue to his novel, The Kingdom of This World. Uh, Carpentier was really referring to the phenomenon of realistic portrayal of fantastic events, but uh, with a peculiarly Latin American twist. For Carpentier, what seemed fantastic, or marvelous, or mar maravilloso in Latin America, was absolutely, literally real. In other words, there are in Latin America historical events and geological and other wonders that are so amazing they cannot be exaggerated. Actually, they must be told completely straight, objectively, because they are believable. They don't need to be hidden. The second style, of course, is mag uh, magical realism. The coined in 1925 by German art critic Franz Roh to describe paintings which demonstrated an altered reality, the first was first revived and applied to the realm of fiction as a combination of the realistic and fantastic in the 1960s by Venezuelan essayist and critic Arturo Uslar Pietri, who applied it to a very specific Latin American genre influenced by the blend of realism and fantasy. In literature, magical, magical realism of, often combines is, uh, the external factors of human existence with the internal ones. It is a fusion between scientific physical reality and psychological human reality. This, in turn, uh, sorry, though, though this amalgamation, uh, or through this amalgamation, magic realism can be more exact in depicting human reality. Nonetheless, a certain person's or group's perception of reality may differ from another. 
To the insider, a given magical realist text can be a relatively accurate depiction of his reality. The same text, however, may appear rather unreal to the outsider, whose perception of reality may differ greatly from the insider. Despite this, the reader, who is often the outsider, can bridge the gap by momentarily suppressing his perception of reality and adopting the reality presented in the text. This, in turn, in turn, equips the reader with the necessary tools required to decode the text. This can be described as the evolved duties of the reader. Two key writers in the development of this style will be Miguel Ángel Asturias in, for example, Hombres de Maíz, where he incorporates Mayan stories written before the conquest of America by the Europeans, such as the Popol Vuh or Los Anales de los Ágil, combining them with his political convictions and channeling them into a life of commitment and solidarity. He sought a direct relationship between magical realism and indigenous mentality saying, and I quote, an Indian or a mestizo in a small village might describe how he saw an enormous stone turn into a person or a giant or a cloud turn into a stone. That is not a tangible reality, but one that involves an understanding of supernatural forces. That is why when I have to give it a literary label, I call it magic realism. The other, of course, will be Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Uh, like Asturias, Gabriel Garcia Marquez is a Nobel Prize winning novelist and a short story writer and novelist, uh, well, and, and other genres as well. But his brand of magical realism does not evolve from an indigenous worldview like uh, Asturias. Rather, it encompasses the totality of human experience as in the fusion described before. Similar explorations will be found in art. When the political, once the political upheavals of the first decades of the 20th century take place, there will be two reactions to the context. A cosmopolitan trend towards taking artistic innovation and experimentation further into what will be known as the avant-garde, a collective term really of ismos that represent an extreme reaction to the chaos and destruction of their context. And this will be part of some international, mostly European styles in vogue and go on to propose new styles and interpretation of their own. The second one will be a search for Pan-American or national identity as the true alternative for Latin American art. And this will evolve into a social, ideological, and activist art coming into its own in the 30s and the 40s. An example of a cosmopolitan art that evolve, evolves in a uniquely, I think, uh, American interpretation is the Anthropophagia movement in Brazil, formulated by Tar Tarsila do Amaral, Oswald de Andrade, and others in the Anthro a Paul Fajit manifesto in Brazil in the late 1920s, early 30s. And it was, it was funny because it was a call to Brazilians to devour European styles, ridding themselves of all direct influences, and to create their own style and culture. Instead of being devoured by Europe, they said, they would devour Europe themselves. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> An example of the second reaction, and these are more examples of that here. There you go. An example of second reaction is nativist and social art. By the 1920s, particularly after the Mexican and Russian revolutions, many artists became political activists and their works became a message that could not be expressed through an abstract form or where the concepts or ideas and their understanding by the viewer were more important than the form or techniques in which they were expressed. Despite their names, social and nativist art were not a unifying phenomenon, but one that was embodied in different images in the different countries, a series of styles then, unified by their concern with the populace, their needs, and aspirations. A good example is Mexico, where several artists with the active support of the state develop a socially and ideological engaged nativist art out of concerns for the problems organization and industrialization were generating in the Latin American societies. They were looking to find their identity in rural zones where blacks and Indians lived free from alien influences and ignorant of what occurred in Europe. And this is an example, Carlos Merida. He's from Guatemala. He's one of Latin, American, uh, Latin America's pioneer modernists. And, um, and he initiated the first pro-Indian art movement in the Americas seven years before the rise of Mexican muralism. Um, like them, uh, uh, Merida, worked, uh, he did work with murals, but he rejected uh, the large scale, uh, scale narrative eventually in favor of more intimate uh, charms of easel painting. Yeah? Uh, like our next example too, Rufino Tamayo from Mexico. 
Eh, Tama, yo experimenté with several European movements like Cubism, Impressionism, Fauvism, eh, but with a distinctly Mexican feel. He was a great formal innovator, um, both as a colorist and as a master of nuances of surface and texture. And as a figurative artist, he created a unique synthesis of European uh, modernism and the ancient arts of Mexico. And his themes include the transitory nature of civilization and man's longing for the eternal, among others. Another important uh, social narrativist trend will be, of course, muralism. We cannot avoid muralism. It is a Mexi the Mexican uh, painting school started during the first decades of the 20th century in the wake of the Mexican Revolution. Diego Rivera, a picture here, and Jose Clemente Orozco, and David Alfaro Siqueiros were the most important artists in the Mexican mural movement, but there are some others as, as well. And um, they really expressed solidarity with the working and farming classes and shared the obsession with non-European aspects of Latin American culture that characterized the indigenous uh, movement. Non-figurative art or abstract art will, will eventually develop and have an especially strong impact on Latin American artists because it proposed a new way of seeing reality. Eventually, the need to incorporate their own reality will mesh with the desire to create something new. That is when hybrid artistic styles will begin to appear in force. The 30s and the 40s will be marked by one of our own uh, hybrid styles. It was a, um, a cultural and artistic, artistic current that will deal with national themes and concerns, but from a more abstract point of view that will be called constructive universalism. And it was led by Joaquin Torres Garcia from Uruguay, uh, and it um, was locally inspired, and it will incorporate elements found in great art regardless of places of origin. And through this movement, he hoped to truly create a, a universal form of expression. Um, in the 40s, modern art, uh, indigenism, social realism, and the stylistic aspects of the mural movement will join with an interest in surrealism and its desire to emphasize the role of dreams and the unconscious in the creative process, particularly after Andre Breton visited Mexico in 1938. To surrealism, though, Latin Americans will add an interest in archetypes, particularly those found in, Latin, in Native American art. The appeal of this hybrid modern art is comparable to that of magical realism, it, really, because they attempt to see past surface reality, something Latin Americans have always sought to do. Art thus provide the tools for interpreting the combination of beauty and horror, loss and possibility that Latin America has always represented. And I think that an artist that represents uh, uh, this creative process is Frida Kahlo. Her paintings rooted in 19th century Mexican portraiture uh, ingeniously incorporated elements of Mexican pop culture and pre-Columbian primitivism that in the 30s and, and so forth had never been done before. They're usually very small paintings, intimate, and they contrast, of course, with the grand mural tradition of her times. And uh, as she said, um, uh, I paint myself, and you see that she does paint herself, because I am so often alone, because I am the subject I know best, even her feet. Okay, another artist I would like to highlight is Wilfredo Lam, a major figurative artist from Cuba, who was responsible for introducing the expressive force of Afro-Caribbean spiritual traditions into modern painting. He had a huge fascination with voodoo, trans states, and the rituals of spiritual transformation, and he added a new poetic dimension to the iconography of surrealism. He synthesized really surrealism with Cubist strategies and incorporated iconography and spirits uh, of Afro-Cuban uh, religion. And really for that reason, his work does not um, belong to a specific art movement. He truly blended his influences and created a very unique, very recognizable style which was ultimately characterized by the prominence of, of hybrid figures. And this one, The Jungle, is considered one of his masterpieces, very exemplary of the author's and mature style. Eventually, he will continue on creating you know, uh, generic figures, creating the universal, and, um, but always uh, in his goals, he, he consistently painted mass-like faces because um, he felt that it, they permeated Cuban culture and mythology and, and dealt with the nature of man, and therefore, you know, he was 
he related to those. From the 60s up to the present, ongoing discussion on the direction of Latin American cultural studies will be influenced by a number of factors, including the liberation theology from the 1960s and 70s, the rise of feminism and other studies centering on the marginal, debates in Latin American philosophy and social science around notions of liberation philosophy and autonomous social science led by, for example, Enrique Dussel, Rodolfo Kusch, Orlando Falborda, and others, the evolution of dependency theory, the debates on Latin American modernity and postmodernity in the 80s, followed by discussions on hybridity in anthropology, communications, and cultural studies in the 80s, in the 90s, and in the United States, the Latin American subaltern studies group. One particular important voice emerging in the 80s will be that of Argentine anthropologist and social theorist Nelson Gar Garci Nestor Garcia Canclini, who's renewed for his work on concepts including hybridity, modernity, postmodernity, and urbanity in Latin America, as well as the relationships between aesthetics, art, and youth cultural networks. And one of his fundamental works is, of course, the hybrid culture, Strategies for Entering and Living Modernity, which was published in 1990. In particular, Garcia Canclini has called for a cultural politics to contain the damaging effects of globalization, questioning whether Latin America can compete in a global marketplace without losing its cultural identity. So uh, he, you know, he tries to clarify that um, in the development of democratic institutions in Latin America, the most of the most destructive ideological trends are still going strong, so we have to address those issues. In the meantime, creative artists continue to push, push on with their own searches. Let me just in, highlight just a few that exemplify the many ways we, in which they continue to bring together elements from all sources to create their own. These are uh, Ana Lidia Vega and Carmen Lugo Filippi, and uh, their 1981 collaboration this is co-written, uh, Virgenes y Martires, really signals a new perception of ownership of the artistic products. One of the story, with the one that is co-written, even allows the reader to choose among three potential endings based on the one that best appeals to their ideological beliefs. So they're really pushing the envelope in terms of the act of writing as well as the form itself, with a text where fiction interacts with literary theory discourse as it becomes both an example and a document of values espoused by feminist and post-colonial theorists. Laura Esquivel, um, La Ley del Amor, or The Law of Love, is another kind of hybrid genre in that it brings together actual elements of graphic arts and music into the literary text, thus creating a multimedia experience for the reader. As in literature in the 80s, um, and it happened in other parts of the world, uh, art will take um, a variety of directions, and it's called pluralism. So it's really hard to sort of talk about specific trends or movements, and attention is more directed to individual artists or even to individual works. So uh, the important thing, though, is that due to the prevalence of democratic political uh, regimes in the 80s, and corporate capital uh, support, the arts uh, will be sort of targeted as something to invest in, which is kind of interesting. Uh, our themes will include individual alienation, urban violence, drug trafficking, governmental corruption, and expression of one's marginalized populations, such as lesbians, gays, and indigenous people and their struggle for equal rights. Some artists that have emerged and fall under this trend are Francisco Toledo, and I think I skipped this, well, uh, who has a range of talents second to none. He's a draftsman, a printmaker, a painter, a sculptor, a ceramist, and um, he has a very interesting mission in that he, he loves animals, but these are not animals conventionally um, associated with beauty. These are bats, iguanas, toads, insects. And he displays a highly developed sense of the fantastic, creating these hybrid creatures, part human and part animal, both playful and monstrous. Jose Alberto Marchi from Argentina eh, has this piece, Solis Flama, which is a series of paintings accompanied by, sound uh, by a sound installation of Circular, a duo formed by Marchi and Daniel Varela in 1999, with the purpose of creating music that would be based on the color or the timbre of the sound and the suspension of time, using strategies that come from minimalism, ancient music, and non-Western traditions. And then one of my favorites, as you can tell, is Hernando Roche Gabel, 
a very prominent artist, uh, really one of the most prominent to emerge from the Caribbean since Wilfredo Lam. And like Lam, Roche will explore issues of identity rooted in his mixed Spanish and Afro-Caribbean uh, ancestry. Uh, the next one is Damian Flores, uh, who is among the most singular of the new generation of Mexican artists. And if you see uh, in this one, you can tell how he's including all this sort of Aztec uh, symbolism to a very, very contemporary um, uh, kind of a social cultural phenomena uh, depicted here. Yeah? The globalization of information has accelerated its spread since the 1980s, and this has also meant that styles, when they exist, tend to be short-lived and used for particular purposes and are very easily copied and appropriated. In literature, the, for me, the best example is uh, Luis Lopez Nieves, who in the heart of Voltaire fuses tradition and virtual technology in the use of emails as a new epistolary model, while using and expanding on traditional detected genre characteristics to expose the globalization of scholarly pursuits. And an ex artistic example of um, globalization is cyber art, which is uh, represented here by Eduardo Cac, and he's international recognized for his interactive net installation and his bio art. He considers himself a transgenic artist or bio artist using biotechnology and genetics to create provocative works that explore scientific techniques and critique them. To conclude, I would like to note that nowadays a group of Latin American academics and intellectuals organize what has been around what has been called the Modernity Coloniality Group is developing a cohesive perspective that seeks to make a decisive intervention into the very discursive, uh, discursivity of the modern sciences in order to craft another space for the production of knowledge, an other way of thinking, or what they call un paradigma otro. Uh, and what they are suggesting is that another thought and other knowledge and another world are indeed uh, possible. So I hope these examples uh, and, and expressions have given some proof to the intellectual and artistic vitality of Latin America uh, and Latin Americans as we search for our own ways of assessing our own reality. I think they also point out the continuity of pluralism and, and hybrid approaches that have marked our voyage towards developing an identity of our own. Thank you. Se você não me querer